So welcome back to part two of glycolysis. We were talking about the regulators of PFK1. And these, this, these are the regulators. And I used a mnemonic called CAAF, C for citrate, A for ATP, the other A for AMP, and F is for fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Now, citrate is going to have a negative effect on PFK1. ATP is also going to have a negative effect on PFK1. What does it mean? It means that when we have lots of citrate, and or we have when we have lots of ATP, this is going to send a signal to PFK1 and say, slow down. We don't need so much glycolysis anymore because we have so much citrate anyways. We have so much ATP anyways. So kind of it's a, it's a kind of a feedback mechanism for PFK1. So those are the uh, those are the negative regulators. In terms of positive regulators, we have AMP and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. The reason it's AMP is because when you have no ATP. AMP is going to tell fructose one phosphate that you know, give us glycolysis, give us some energy to make more ATP, and the reason it's fructose two six bisphosphate is because um, fructose two six bisphosphate is an allosteric regulator. It's going to tell PFK one that we have lots of fructose two six bisphosphate. That means we have lots of sugar coming in, and kind of increase your metabolism and increase your glycolysis pathway so that we can move forward. So that's why. Um, you know, fructose 6 bisphosphate is also a positive regulator. This thing is so important to memorize. We have to memorize this because the way they're going to ask you a question is, you know, they can tell you an entire story of entire vignette which might not even be related to this and in the end they might ask you, you know, which of these enzymes is going to have a positive effect on PFK1 or a negative effect on PFK1. That's where this is very, very important. You have to know this by heart. When we talk about regulators for PFK2, we're talking about something more simple. Like, for example, you can easily get confused here if they say that insulin, so that's one of the options, says insulin is a positive regulator of PFK1. That would be wrong because insulin is a positive regulator for PFK2, not PFK1. Or glucagon is a negative regulator for, for PFK2. So these two does not come in play in PFK1 regulation, okay? So it's very, very important to memorize this entire, entire box. Um, I know it's obvious, like to me it was obvious too, but I kept on getting these kind of questions wrong. So that's, that's where the memory comes in. You know what? I'm going to mark it all red. It's very, very important. Okay, so that's that. Moving on. We stopped at uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. From fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, we're going to use an enzyme called aldolase to give us two carbon, sh carbon atoms. Uh, sorry, we're going to break our six molecule of glucose into two, three molecules of glucose, glycerol dehydrophosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Now, remember how we used ATP here? in glucokinase right here, we used one ATP. So anything that happens from this step onwards, from glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate down, if we use one ATP or if we make one ATP, we have to think that we are making two of these because there is two compounds that is being made. Okay, there is two of the same thing. So one is equivalent to two. So, so far we have only used one ATP. Okay, so using our glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate, uh, and by the way, glycerol dehydrate phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate, they can go hand in hand, you know, they can switch their shapes by using the enzyme isomerase because they're isomers of each other. So DHAP can be converted to glycerol dehydrate 3 phosphate. Now, glycerol dehydrate 3 phosphate combines with the enzyme glycerol dehydrate 3 phosphodehydrogenase. What does dehydrogenase mean? It's getting rid of one of the hydrogen and using NAD. NAD is coming from the substrate level phosphorylation from inside mitochondria and inorganic phosphate and we're getting 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 1,3-bisphospho, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Phosphor, meaning there is one phosphate in carbon number one, another phosphate in carbon number three, because you're using this inorganic phosphate to add into it, and we are making one NAD 
H. And the reason we're getting this H is because we're using the enzyme glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. Dehydrogen. We are removing one of the hydrogen, adding to the NADH. This NADH is going inside the mitochondria, taking part of taking part in the substrate level phosphorylation, and this NADH is also used in other uh, other other pathways. So just you know, I just wanted to throw it out there. Now continuing on the 1,3-base phosphoglycerate. The 1,3-base phosphoglycerate is going to combine with phosphoglycerate kinase using 1 ATP to give us 3, three phosphoglycerate. Now this is where it gets interesting. We're using 1 ATP here. And remember I just mentioned that um, whenever we use 1 ATP, it's not really 1 ATP, it's actually 2 ATPs because there is 2 of these, because there is 2 of the 3 phosphoglycerate. So even though we used, sorry, this is not ATP, it's ADP. ADP. We're using ADP to make one ATP. Okay, so remember how we used an ATP earlier in glucokinase. Now we're generating ATP here, okay? And we're actually, even though we used one ATP there, we're generating two ATPs because this is taking place twice. This is taking place twice. Okay, so it's like that. We are generating two ATPs rather than one ATP. So that's also one very important thing that we had to remember. So now we have 3-phosphoglycerate. Three 3-phosphoglycerate three then becomes 2-phosphoglycerate. I'm just going to talk about it and not really, you know, these are not that important step. So I'm just going to quickly talk about it. So 3-phosphoglycerate becomes 2-phosphoglycerate using the enzyme mutase. 2-phosphoglycerate becomes Phosphoenositalpyruvate using the enzyme enolase. And okay, maybe I will do this. Um, so we have 3 phosphoglycerate being converted to 2 phosphoglycerate using the enzyme mutase. From 2 phosphoglycerate, it's been converted to um, PEP, phosphoenositalpyruvate. And this, and here we are using the enzyme. You know this okay and there's a clinical the reason I wanted to talk about you know this is because there is a clinical correlation here and the clinical correlation is that enolase can be inhibited by fluoride okay and where do we find fluoride we find fluoride in um, teeth whitening so a lot of old people tend to have fluoride poisoning because they use teeth whitener fluoride can also be found in um, fluoride can also be found in um, water tap water another quickly uh, another quick um, a clinical correlation is uh, glucose 3 phosphate dehydrogenase glucose 3 phosphate dehydrogenase that one has mercury toxicity Okay, that has mercury toxicity, and uh, how can you have mercury toxicity? You can have it from tuna, okay. eating canned tuna, you can have mercury toxicity. And last but not the least, when we are talking about NADPH or NADH, you know, there is here we can also talk about niacin, or you know, when you have niacin deficiency, um, you can have dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia, and in the end, you can have death, and um, by use by the by the disease called pellagra. I'm sure you know it. I'm just putting it all in together. And when you don't have um, when you know something uh, a disease which is very similar to pellagra is heart nub. Heart nub's disease when it's not really nice in that's default. It's the defective renal transport of tryptophan. So defective transport of tryptophan okay all right so I wanted to just throw it out there those are also very very important uh, moving on to our PEP now our PEP is going to give us last but not the least this is also an important step um, PEP is going to combine with pyruvate kinase to give us uh, pyruvate 
okay to give us pyruvate now here also this is also a regulatory step um, and pyruvate has a lot of regulatory factors um, associated with it and I also have a strange mnemonic here I call it a fake so a there's three a's a a a f i g okay I know it's done it's kind of silly but it works for me so for the first A is ATP, it's a negative regulator. Okay, I'm not going to go into discuss, you know, what a regulator is. I already talked about it. I'm just going to say what they are. The second A is acetyl CoA. So that's also has a, it's also a negative regulator. And the the last A is alanine. This is also a negative regulator. And how, how do we? Uh, find alanine. Pyruvate, pyruvate can go into five different pathways and when I'll talk about pyruvate I'll talk about this and one of the pathway is that it can form alanine. So alanine is also a negative regulator. Um, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This is a positive regulator. Okay, uh, This is a positive regulator and um, for I I have insulin. Okay, insulin is also a positive regulator. So see, I mean, it's so hard to kind of predict what is going to be a what's going to be a regulator and what it's not going to be a regulator. So that's why I always uh, memorize them. This is, you know, I just memorize them, and there is no magic to it. I think. So this is my regulators for pyruvate. Uh, pyruvate kinase, sorry. These are the regulators for pyruvate kinase regulators. Okay, so the, the negative regulators are ATP, acetyl CoA, alanine, and glucagon. The positive regulators is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and insulin. I mean, you know, I mean, you can say, oh, it just makes sense. But when you're sitting in the exam and you're thinking, is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate a positive regulator for P, uh, pyruvate kinase? You know, I mean, you can be confused with that. Insulin, glucagon, these two make sense. But see how insulin and glucagon were not positive or negative regulators for PFK1. So, you know, I would, I would just memorize them. So it's very, very important. Here, you know, I have another... Uh, I'm a little rushing right now because I don't want to make another video on uh, glycolysis. I just want to say everything that I want to... I want to talk about in this video. So, uh, in the end, I also want to say that... Um, there is another clinical correlation with pyruvate kinase, and that is um, it can it can actually cause hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic anemia, and um, usually they say that you know both brother and the sisters are affected which kind of differentiates it from G6PD hemolytic anemia and they're also going to say they can also you know give a pedigree tree where you can find out that it's an autosomal recessive problem okay unlike um, G6PD so it's autosomal recessive found in both brothers and sisters no Heinz bodies no Heinz bodies okay I don't get confused and think that you know that it has Heinz bodies too. So um, and 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 it, it often this question I see often um, talking about pyruvate kinase deficiency, hemolytic anemia. Um, so I think that's about it with with respect to glycolysis. I think I talked about every single aspect that I know on glycolysis. So I hope I didn't ramble on for too long um, and I will post these notes on my blog so if you need them they're going to be there and leave me a comment and let me know um, how you like the videos um, and until until next video um, happy new year because today is uh, 31st okay bye